Thank you for joining me for <coughs> part four of my 2017 general election forecast. I'm hoping you've uh, seen part one, two and three. Uh, part one looking at uh, the, what my forecast is based on the opinion polls. I'm expecting a conservative Labour lead, a conservative lead over Labour of 9.5%. In part two, I argued that we are in a genuine realignment election, so traditional drivers can't be used. And the lead vote uh, in 2016 was the strongest driver. In part three, I explained my forecasting model, and now I'm going to show you what the outcome of my forecasting model. Uh, so, without any further ado, let's go. Uh, yeah, let's go. So, my forecast. Uh, Theresa May to match what Maggie Thatcher did in 1987. A majority of 100, 375 seats, uh, which should be an increase of 45 seats from 330 in 2015. Um, I'm actually expecting Conservatives to lose nine seats, but they're again uh, 54 seats. So their losses were more than outweigh their, uh, sorry, their gains were more than outweigh their losses. In part uh, two, I showed that, um, sorry, in part three, I showed that the swing from um, Conservative to Labour is not uniform across the country. In the South, Labour are narrowing the gap on the Conservatives, but the Conservatives have a, a healthy majority than many seats there. So even if Labour gets more votes, they're not necessarily going to get more seats. Um, but in the North and Midland, the Conservatives were narrowing the gap on Labour. Labour um, and they were able to do that officially to actually start taking seats. And especially when you start to take the Leave vote into account. The Leave voters were particularly more prominent in the North and uh, Midland. So it, it had an effect that even though the in 2015 um, the Conservative lead over Labour was 6.5%, that realignment of voters around Brexit meant that even if... Um, the lead, Conservative lead over Labour was still 6.5% in 2017, the Conservative could expect to gain uh, about 30 seats, 20 to 30 seats, I've uh, forgotten to make a note of that point. Um, so even with an unchanged lead, uh, Conservative could expect to make gain. Um, and that's a really important factor to bear in mind. We'll see some chart uh, with that uh, later on. Labour are expected to make them gain. For a long time, I was expecting Labour not to make any gains at all. Um, but the recent surge in the polls, um, even allowing for the fact that I think the polls are not right, are putting Labour in place to make them gain in the South at the expense of the Conservatives. Uh, also gaining some Lib Dem seats. And for the Lib Dems, sorry, I'm afraid it's going to be a disaster. The vote is unchanged in 2017. But they are not closing the gap on the Conservatives or Labour. And as a result, um, those six seats, are going, four of them, I think, are going to go to the Conservative, two are going to go to uh, Labour. And the net result, uh, well, we'll see the net result in uh, a minute. So uh, UKIP to lose their seat in Clapton. I mean, Douglas Cardwell resigned from UKIP in any case. Uh, the Greens to hold on to Brighton. Uh, and the Nationalists are going to be down, um, uh, primarily due to the Conservatives making their revival in Scotland. I'm betting the Nationalists still to hold on to the majority of seats, um, but uh, they're going to lose some there. But the big story is this uh, gain here. The Conservatives making 54 gains, which more than outweigh what um, they lose. Uh, we can actually see the map here. Um, so I've got 2010, 2015 and 2017. Now you can see the realignment in Scotland where it all went yellow, more or less. Um, and the Conservatives expected to come back in the border areas and in the northeast of Scotland. Though traditionally were their heartland, I'm expecting the Conservatives to make uh, some gains there. Labour also expected to make a couple of gains in Scotland um, there. But it's worth uh, remembering, though, that um, you know the Labour are still down, and this is the effect of realignment. The Labour vote is expected to be up, but the number of seats are expected to be down. And bear that in mind, this is the big problem for Labour. In 
they are gaining votes, but they're gaining votes in the wrong area. For start, as I said, they're gaining votes in the south. So you can see some gains here. Stroud, Bristol North West, uh, Reading East, where I actually used to live. Uh, all of these are expected to go to Labour. Uh, Bedford, another one expected to go to Labour in the south. Uh, as well as uh, in London, actually, net change not much um, overall in London. But certainly in the south, Labour expected to make a few gains and a couple of seats in uh, Scotland. But for the most part, if you're piling up votes in the south, you're piling it up against huge conservative majorities. It's not enough to dent those. Secondly, if you're piling up votes among young voters, where do young voters tend to live? Um, where they are disproportionately in university towns. And what do uh, student and university places tend to do? They vote Labour. So to gain more votes amongst students, just make sure that those seats stay Labour. There's an additional dynamic that I picked up um, from looking at the ITM polls. Now, um, there's one thing that I uh, haven't raised before is that in, we have an election here where Jeremy Corbyn is this older man, you know, this white-haired man, giving off a sort, some people say he looks a bit like Father Christmas, uh, promising a lot, uh, who's getting some very good reception amongst young people. Um, he's also a serial rebel within the Conservative Party until he um, took hold of the party. Uh, the Conservatives are being led by a woman, again in her 60s, but rather establishment. So you've got an older rebel uh, man uh, fighting uh, an establishment woman. Does that remind you of something? If you know your US politics, it should remind you of a Democratic primary between Standard and Clinton. Um, and it was well documented that Standard get, got a lot of enthusiasm among young voters um, and in the North and from white voters. But where Standard failed completely was uh, among black voters and in the South. Now, one dynamic that's not been picked up here is the ethnic minority vote. Uh, ICM are the only pollsters to track the ethnic minority vote. And even then, the sample sizes for ethnic minority votes are quite poor. But what I can tell you from looking at those numbers is that the Conservatives are making gains equally among white and non-white voters. Labour are making gains among white voters, but they are down considerably among non-white voters, about 10 to 12 percent. Now, small sample sizes, so subject to a lot of areas. But we've just highlighted that where you get student town, Labour tends to do well. The other kind of seat where Labour does well are city centres and particularly constituency with a high ethnic minority vote. But if the Labour is gaining votes in the south against large Tory uh, minority, gaining votes in uh, areas uh, such as student town where they already hold a seat, and losing votes in ethnic minority areas, that adds up to an, a totally inefficient strategy of vote gain. So the, this is why I say you, it, the fact that Labour is gaining votes, they are gaining votes inefficiently, and that's why I'm expecting them to lose seats, and that's why the Conservatives will gain seats. This is the effect of realignment, uh, as we see here. Now, the Lib Dems are down to two seats, and their only seats that remain are the Orkneys up here and the Sarah Dijon in uh, Wales, which means the Lib Dems are wiped out in England. Now, if you saw part three, I showed you that the forecast that Tim Farron would lose the Westmoreland Lonsdale seat is right on the edge um, here. Um, but the Nick Hallam uh, seat in uh, she uh, Sheffield Hallam, sorry, Nick Clegg's seat in Sheffield Hallam, um, uh, here it is, uh, and if you look at my two models that I average uh, here, this one looks like a pretty clear win for Labour. I'm saying this is a Labour game from the Lib Dem, and I think Nick Clegg has gone. Uh, Tim Farron might still be able to hold on because my two models give dramatically different answers there, but uh, they're gone in uh, Sheffield Hallam. Um, and the other three leave seat that uh, Lib Dems had in England, uh, North Norfolk, Carthorton, uh, Southport, they're gone. Um, and there's another Lib Dem seat somewhere that uh, I'm expecting them to lose. So I'm expecting a Lib Dem to be wiped out in England. So 
that the rather dramatic picture um, there. The breakdown by region is given in this table here. So um, you can see how the Labour are making a few gains in the south, but nowhere near enough uh, to over overcome the losses they're making in the north. Um, and the Conservatives can put up with a few losses in the south and more than enough uh, make gains in the north. Uh, in, indeed, in Yorkshire, they may even end up with a majority of seats there. Um, Wales, they'll make a few more advances uh, there. And the Midland, um, uh, Northwest, uh, expecting to make some gains here. Um, I should point out, by the way, in Scotland, my two models, uh, Brexit realignment and non uniform regional swing, give quite different results. Um, so Scotland's hard to call and it's a bit difficult model. What, without doubt, is the Conservatives are up in vote. Um, nationalists are down. Labour may or may not are either down or unchanged in their vote there. So uh, Scotland could be very interesting. Now, um, Labour I'm predicting to be down 30 seats. If that happened and they end up with less than 209 seats, that they'd be a worst ever performance since 1935. Um, 1983, they're 209 seats. Um, well, I'm projecting them to be. Uh, go down and possibly even be under 200 seats. So for all the gain in vote that Labour seems to be getting, the inefficiency of it means that they actually could end up with their worst ever performance for uh, 80 years. Uh, this table here gives you some idea where the Conservatives are making their gains. Overall, they're making 45 gains net. Uh, but there's some losses uh, as well. And this table shows you, um, you know, where the, the seats are in 2015, where I expect them to be in 2017, and the changes. And I split the seat by, was it an existing Conservative seat? Was it a Labour seat? Was it another party? That for England and Wales, and then for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, and I've divided by whether it Remain and Leave seat. So you can see the Conservative losses are expected to be in Remain, their own Remain seat. Not including Bath, which my own uh, seat, but there's a number of Conservative Remain seats where we're expecting them uh, to lose. Uh, an example actually is Reading East. So if I just pull up Reading East, I used to live in Reading East. So, where, oh yeah, there it is. So in 2005, um, the Conservatives actually gained Reading East from Labour when I was living there, <coughs> and they held on to the seat. But it voted 40% uh, leave, it was a Remain seat, by some margin. And that dynamic, I think, is enough to turn it into a margin on which Labour would just about take. Uh, so both of my models here are predicting small Labour majorities uh, from what was uh, a safe Conservative majority. So Conservatives need to focus on uh, Reading East. Uh, another Remain seat that I expect them to lose in the South, I think it's Stroud. So I'll just go to uh, Stroud. Um, come on. There we go. And again, I had a smaller majority at the last election. Actually, both of my, my, my models give different results, but on average, it's a small gain. So this is another thing to bear in mind, that these projected gains for Labour in the South are actually very marginal. It just shows that, yes, Labour are making some gains in the South, but only just enough to, to register them, and they may not even make them, which is why that 202 seat could go down. Uh, another seat I'm expecting to happen is the SNP leader in the common... Um, to lose his seat in the seat of Moray. So I'll bring up Moray and we'll have a, a look at that uh, here. So this was an SMP seat, uh, 49, 18% majority, but it almost voted leave. It, one of uh, Scotland, I think only two seats I estimated voted leave. Moray was almost one of them. Um, and that leave uh, unionist dynamic I think it's going to take uh, the Conservatives over the edge. The interesting, on Brexit realignment in Scotland, it's very, very narrow. But on non-uniform regional swing, it's a comfortable uh, win. Now, by the way, if you're interested in seeing the more detailed forecast, you can see it's a spreadsheet that allows you to choose seats and see uh, what the uh, results are. Uh, I'll bring up Hexham. I grew up in the Hexham constituency. Um, 
I know that's a solid uh, conservative hold um, there. Um, if you'd like to actually have a copy of this spreadsheet, then please go to my website, uh, marriott-stack.com, and find my email address and email me. I'm not prepared to put the spreadsheet on my website for downloading because uh, it's slightly fragile. Um, but if you email me and you really want to see those seat-by-seat -seat, uh, details, then I'm happy to uh, send you a copy of the spreadsheet. So... Um, there's my forecast for the election, uh, a working majority of 105 seats. Um, the, the reason I talk about a working majority is that um, there's 650 seats in the House of Commons, so I'm expecting the Conservatives to win 375, other parties winning 275. So at first sight, that seems like a seat or a majority of 100. But the Speaker doesn't have a vote. He stands as an independent. He's this um, other here. Um, and Sinn Féin had four seats in 2015, and they don't take their seat, so they don't vote. So take those five people out, and the effective majority goes up to 105. Now, my forecast, uh, that, or the forecast on which the um, seat or numbers are generated from, assumed an overall national lead of 9.5% for the Conservative over Labour. You remember that that was a, a weighted average of modellers such as the pollsters for ICM, Comrades and TNS, who are showing an average lead of 11.5% um, versus the, all the other polls, which I call self-reporters. Uh, they're showing an average lead of 5.4%. So these were the two extremes uh, that I had to make a choice between, and I chose to take two-thirds of this and one-third of that. But what I've done here is to show you, well, what if the modelers are totally right? You can see the Conservatives go up to almost 400 seats, and Labour will definitely be below 200. Um, so that would be an even better result for the Conservative. Um, or what if the self-reporters are right? These young people really are going to turn out um, and not the Conservatives lead down. Well, I said before, because of the realignment nature of the election and the fact that the Labour is gaining votes in an inefficient manner, that means the Conservatives can afford to allow them to lead to narrow and still gain seat. You can see in this scenario, the effective majority uh, would still be... Uh, 59. That's an error there. That's zero there for 2015. That should say 15 uh, there. So, um, but they would still gain 22 seats on net. This time they would lose 14, gain 36. Uh, Labour barely unchained um, with lotted out, netting out um, gain uh, there. Uh, but that would leave the Conservative with a a working majority of 59 seats, which I think for Theresa May, that would be still be disappointing. I mean, she would take it, but she would be disappointed with that. Um, but so if you're a Conservative voter, um, don't get, you know, too worried by the fact that the polls are narrowing. It is disappointing for a Conservative. No question about that. I'm sure you'd love it to be this. Um, but I am pretty sure that voters are realigning themselves in such a way that it favours the Conservative. And now... Right at the very start of part one, I pointed out that for the Conservative majority to disappear, Labour have to get the lead down to 3%. Um, in an earlier post on my blog a couple of days ago, I said it was 3.5%, but I discovered an error in my calculation and redid it, and it's actually uh, smaller, 3%. So um, if the polls continue to narrow and they get down to 3%, then we are into hung Parliament territory. But I don't expect that to happen. I'm expecting a majority of uh, 100 or so. Uh, and these tables here said we're looking really for something between 60 and 140. So there I conclude uh, my forecast. If you want to see the details of the seat-by-seat -seat forecast, uh, when you go to my website, um, yeah, the post there where you can get a spreadsheet that downloads the expected results for each seat. Um, and as I say, if you want the more detailed uh, spreadsheet where you can see the individual dynamic of each seat, um, you know, etc., going through all of it, then email me separately and I can give you a copy of that spreadsheet. But thank you very much uh, for listening to my forecast and I look forward to hearing your comments.